All right, everybody, another year, another fantasy season is upon us. Uh, I know I'm doing this one a little bit later than I normally do. Uh, that Cardinals episode took a lot. <laughs> that one was about 150 hours of work. So I'm getting to fantasy a little bit later than normal this year, but happy to be doing it for third or fourth year in a row now. So let's get to it. I'm, I'm going to be doing it a little bit different this year. I'm kind of focusing on sleepers that I'm really zeroing in on at every single position. I've got 10 guys total that I want to talk about in depth. I'll of course be kind of putting my early rankings on the screen as I talk about each position group. If you're a member of the Patreon, it doesn't matter how much you give. It can be even as little as a dollar. You get full access to the PPR rankings, the standard rankings, both by position and combined in Excel uh, Excel spreadsheets. I've got PDFs. Like it's, it's a whole thing. So if you're a member of the Patreon, again, it only costs a dollar. It doesn't matter how much you give. Anybody over a dollar uh, will get access to that. Or if you hadn't noticed, I've got merch now, which uh, again, if you told me three years ago that that was going to be a thing, I would have laughed in your face, but you guys are just an incredibly supportive family that I've got here. Uh, I, I never thought that this channel would get to where it is today to the point where like having a logo and a brand would be a thing uh, and that I would get paid to drink an old fashioned on camera, a damn good old fashioned at that, which I'll have the recipe on screen for that too, because it's kind of a different take that I've kind of been developing lately. But uh, anybody who buys any Film Room merch, I got hats, I got beanies, I got shirts, also gets access to the Fantasy Rankings if you don't want to be a member of the Patreon. And if you do buy any of my merch, you get access to those. If you email me at the email that I'll put on the screen now, uh, you also get unlimited Q&A with me uh, as a token of my appreciation for you supporting me through buying uh, you know, branded merch. So hopefully... Hopefully that works out. Uh, I'm kind of winging it here in this whole YouTube thing. Uh, I just kind of started it to talk about football, and here we are. So without further ado, let's talk about football. We're going to start with the wide receiver position, and I've got three guys that I'm really zeroing in on uh, for sleepers, uh, among a few others, but these are the three that kind of consistently end up on my team's the most. And so we're going to start with Steelers rookie receiver Chase Claypool. Now, the thing you have to know about Claypool is he's a very complementary skill set to what they already have, and he's kind of a missing piece for that receiving core. So when you look at what they already have, they have Juju, who's predominantly a slot receiver for them. He can play outside, and weirdly enough, some of Juju's best games are when he takes a majority of his snaps outside, whether it's 2018 or last year, 2019, his only 100-yard game was the only game in which he played predominantly outside. That was against Miami. But he had three or four hundred yard games in 2018 where he was predominantly playing outside as well. So he can play outside, but they like to put him mostly in the slot. And so when you look at how they uh, took Claypool, they were really trying to get a big physical presence that could play kind of a true alpha X receiver prototype for them that could allow them to leave Juju inside. You still got Deontay Johnson there, who's more of a Z for them. And you got James Washington, who's kind of a, a dedicated deep threat for them. So they're four deep at receiver, but Claypool is... In my opinion, he's going to be the alpha for them down in the red zone. And I almost think that they're actually going to put him in the slot down in the red zone and then move Juju outside. Because I think even though Juju is a really good, quote unquote, big slot receiver, uh, his one weakness, I think, as a slot receiver or playing that big slot role is physicality. I feel like he gets bullied a little bit. Uh, when teams kind of match size for size down there. There was a play uh, against Seattle down in the red zone last year that I'm thinking of where they're trying to throw up a slot fade to him. He gets bullied straight into the sideline, can't make it to the ball. And Claypool, I think they're bringing in specifically to fill that role, which is we're having him playing outside in between the 20s where he's just going to muscle corners all day long, you know, get back shoulder balls, get fades, all that kind of stuff. And then down in the red zone where they do like to call slot fades, that's going to be him. I think they're going to put Juju outside, who's a really good route runner, got a little bit more speed than Claypool in my opinion. I know Claypool timed really well, but to me, Juju's play speed is better. Uh, so you put Juju outside and then Claypool in the slot. And I think they're really going to be using him a lot in the red zone. So where I look at him in terms of fantasy value 
you know, I have him as around 11th or 12th round value, if I remember correctly. Again, I'll have that on the screen. His ADP is undrafted. You know, he's getting undrafted in a lot of leagues. More people are going after Juju, going after Deontay, who I also have graded fairly high for fantasy. I think I have him like around a, a mid-round, like 7th, 8th round. Um, but, you know, most leagues are not drafting Chase Claypool. But I think there's a very realistic scenario where he leads this team in touchdown catches because he is a dominant, and I mean dominant, jump ball receiver. I think Ben's going to love him. We've seen a lot of clips from training camp so far where they're kind of getting in sync on jump balls and, you know, how Ben reads leverage. So where he's going to put the ball based on how he reads leverage and then, you know, how he kind of trusts Chase to adjust to it. Almost every single clip that I've seen of Claypool in training camp is them working on 50-50 balls and and fades and all that kind of stuff. So that I think is going to be his primary role. And so when you're looking at him as probably a 13th, 14th round pick for you, that's a wide receiver five that I think you can plug in as like an emergency flex at first. If you're going up against a defense that have a, has a really small nickel corner that you think they're going to be abusing in the red zone, you can maybe get a touchdown out of that, maybe double digit points out of that for a 13th or 14th round pick. And you're in business with that. And then as the season goes on, as his role expands, I think it's only going to get better from there. So I would not be shocked to see Claypool play a massive role in this offense. And for a receiver whose ADP is undrafted at the moment, you know, if if you can get him on your team as a wide receiver five, basically for free, that I think is an excellent value. So I'm going to be zeroing in on Claypool in virtually every single league, especially in standard scoring leagues where touchdowns are at a premium, because I think he's going to be a monster in that format. Now, receiver number two is another rookie, this time over in Minnesota, where I think it's going to be a little bit harder for him to get on the field at first just because of the offense he's in. But I think Justin Jefferson is uh, kind of a Stephon Diggs 2.0 for the Vikings. Not necessarily that they're the exact same player. I think uh, Justin Jefferson more compares to Keenan Allen than Stephon Diggs, which is still very high praise. Uh, honestly, maybe even has a little bit more juice than Keenan, but he's a phenomenal route runner, great ball skills, extremely loose in the hips. I mean, great, great feet. He also was primarily a slot receiver for LSU, but he can play outside no problem. I don't really think he's going to have a problem with fitting into this offense, but ahead of him, you've got Adam Thielen, who's the established number one, and then BC Johnson is having a hell of a camp So they're kind of in a really tight battle right now for the number two receiver role. I think if they're in a shootout and they're in 11 all day, yeah, Jefferson's going to eat. But it might be a little while until he gets on the field as an established number two. But that being said, he is the most talented receiver on that team. I think it's just the fact that uh, B.C. Johnson's having a good camp, and we know that Mike Zimmer is not super enthusiastic about playing rookies right away, even when they're really damn good. Uh, you know, case in point, Stephon Diggs, where it took him five or six weeks to get on the field, even though he was honestly their most talented receiver from day one. I think a similar thing's going to happen where it might take until Thanksgiving for Justin Jefferson to get his shot. But everywhere from like early November all the way through the fantasy playoffs, Jefferson's going to be a monster. He is the most talented receiver on that team. I think it would not shock me if by Christmas, he's the number one receiver on that team, even over Adam Thielen because he's a flat-out beast. They took him in the first round for a reason. He is phenomenal. So when I look at this team, again, it's more of me banking on the talent than banking on the role like I am for Claypool. I mean, Claypool's talented too. I saw him down at the Senior Bowl. He was throwing people over the place. Um, But Justin Jefferson's one of the five best receivers in this whole class. Could argue one of the four best receivers in this whole class. Uh, And I I think he's, he's the most talented receiver there. And so I'm banking on that talent to get him on the field. And then once he gets on the field, he's not getting off. Like, as much as I like B.C. Johnson, Jefferson's better. So I I wouldn't pay attention to September and October for him. But again, you're getting him for free. I've got an 11th round uh, grade on him for fantasy, but in most leagues, he's going in the 14th-ish, I would say. I think his average ADP is is somewhere between 12th, uh, 12th and the 15th round. So again, he's going as a wide receiver five in almost every league. So you might as well get him as your wide receiver five as your kind of playoff stash. And you just kind of, you know, ride the lows as long as you can. I think if, as long as you're, 
uh, not getting killed by injuries to the point where you have to get another guy that needs to contribute immediately. If you can hold off and just keep him on your roster until probably November is when I expect him to really take a prominent role, you can then play him every single week after that, just like what happened with Stephon Diggs owners way back in the day, where, again, he was also a either a very late round pick or an undrafted guy in most fantasy leagues when Diggs was a rookie. So it's the same exact scenario. Be patient, trust the talent. Jefferson's amazing. Nothing against Thielen, nothing against BC Johnson, but Jefferson is that damn good. So just, again, take him 14th round or whatever it is that he's going as your wide receiver five and just just trust me, okay? You need to hold on to him. He's going to be that kind of dude. And then the number three receiver that I really want to highlight is kind of the opposite of Jefferson. He's a more short-term play, primarily because of injuries, and that's Kendrick Bourne over in the Bay up in San Francisco. Uh, he He's one of the more established receivers, believe it or not, uh, in, in San Francisco, even though it seems like they keep bringing in guys to replace him. But because Debo's hurt, and we don't think he's going to be around for week one, potentially not even being in there till late September, uh, foot injuries can be kind of finicky. Uh, Ayuk tweaked a hammy, so who knows if he's going to be there in week one, and he might not even be 100% for a while, because hammies also can be finicky. And then obviously, Hurd just tore his ACL. So they're three receivers down two weeks into camp. Uh, you know, Kendrick Bourne's the only X receiver they've got left. Like, he's he's going to be the guy early. And when you look at their schedule as well, even though I expect them to run a lot of 22 personnel, a lot of 12 personnel, you know, I, I don't expect them to go heavy into 11 personnel early just because they don't have the receivers to do it right now. But Kendrick Bourne is going to be the one receiver they have on the field when they're in 22. And, you know, they got Kittle out there. they got Char- Charlie Warner out there, Mostert, Juszczyk, you know, Kendrick Bourne's going to be the one receiver. So I think he's going to be leading this team, or at least leading their receivers in targets uh, for probably the first month of the season. And when you look at the defenses they're playing, you know, Arizona, depending on whether or not Patrick Peterson is shadowing him, uh, I don't really think they have the horses at boundary corner to keep up with Bourne. And then obviously the Jets and Giants, who are their week two and week three matchups, are a mess at boundary corner. So Bourne, I think, is going to absolutely feast in the first three weeks of the season until Ayuk gets back and until Debo gets back. So you might as well stash him on your roster for a probably 10th or 11th round pick. You know, use him as your flex play the first few weeks, have him put up just crazy numbers and then dump him and trade him for something that you can use more long term, like potentially Justin Jefferson. So that's another play you can do if Maybe you kind of want to get Claypool as your wide receiver five, Bourne as your temporary wide receiver four, and then move him for Jefferson since we assume Jefferson's not going to be getting a whole lot of uh, work early in the year. So kind of how you build your roster around when you expect guys to pop is also very, very important, especially at the wide receiver position. And Kendrick Bourne, to me, I think is going to be a huge player uh, on fantasy teams this September just because of the injuries. And again, this is not me saying that Kendrick Bourne is only going to get work because of injuries, because he does have a good relationship with Jimmy. He does have a good relationship with Kyle. I mean, Kyle Shanahan loves him. And I think we saw last year when we're looking at Dante Pettis, who is more talented than Bourne, uh, talent doesn't necessarily matter to Kyle Shanahan if he's if you're in his doghouse. Like, he's going to play guys he trusts, and he trusts Kendrick Bourne. That's why he stayed on the roster all this time, even though he was an undrafted guy. Like, Kyle Shanahan loves this dude. He trusts him to execute his system. So again, he's going to be heavily, heavily targeted in the first three weeks until Ayuk is up to speed and until Debo comes back. Um, and and there's, there's nothing really else to compete with him because I'm not 100% sure if Dante Pettis is still going to be uh, a thing there. I, I, I still don't know if Kyle trusts him, but we know he trusts Bourne. So again, After you take your first three receivers, if you can kind of keep Kendrick Bourne in your back pocket as a wide receiver four, that you fully intend to just kind of use him and lose him in the first month of the season, that I think is a very prudent play. Just keep an eye on what happens with Ayuk. You know, if he's, as long as Ayuk is not playing, Kendrick Bourne should be in your lineup. And then as long as Debo is on the sideline, Kendrick Bourne should be in your lineup. But as soon as you think that those guys are going to come back, trade Bourne a week early when you can still get some value out of him. Uh, shoot for a guy like Justin Jefferson. Shoot for a guy like, you know, maybe Anthony McFarlane, who we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, get somebody that you think is going to pop later in the year that people are kind of getting a little antsy about. 
you know, again, we're, we're trying to time the peaks of these players so that you're always kind of getting them at the peaks and not at the valleys. So it's, there's a lot of nuance to it. And if you're more of like a set it and forget it type fantasy player, don't even worry about Kendrick Bourne because it's going to take a lot of babysitting for you. There's other guys you can take where it's more set it and forget it. But if you're a very active fantasy owner, you make a lot of trades, you're willing to make a lot of deals. He's going to be one of your major trade pieces this year. So we're going to get to running backs in just a second. But before we do, I want to thank our sponsor for this week. Uh, one of the, the best sponsors that I've got in this channel. One of the ones that I enjoy working with the most because I absolutely love them. And that's HelloFresh. Obviously, eating home-cooked meals has become a lot more prevalent these days instead of going out. And HelloFresh has been clutch for me and my wife over the last few months so that we can get delicious recipes and ingredients delivered safely right to our door. Every single delivery gives us something new that we've never tried before, and every meal that we've had from HelloFresh has been really, really delicious. One of the recipes they just sent me this month was for a spinach and ricotta cheese ravioli with chicken sausage and tomatoes, and it was fantastic. All of the ingredients were fresh, they were perfectly portioned out, and it was honestly one of the better home-cooked meals that I've made this whole summer. It was also really easy to make too, just by following their instructions, even if you're not the most confident person at cooking. So don't worry about not being able to make or kind of replicate any of these recipes for yourself because they really do make it as easy as possible. Also keep in mind that there are tons of other recipes for you to choose from every single week on HelloFresh, even low calorie or vegetarian options, just so that you can learn to cook as many different styles of food as you can. And on average, HelloFresh customers save 28% in cost compared to going to their local grocery store to buy the same ingredients to make the same meals. Plus, each meal is portioned out perfectly. You're not buying a bunch of extra food that ends up going to waste. So HelloFresh is more sustainable as well. And, you know, for people like me that work 60 plus hours a week, as I mentioned, the Cardinals episode took me like 150 hours over the course of three and a half weeks. That was a monster. I mean, there were times where I was sleeping like three or four hours a night and I just, I didn't have time to go grocery shopping. I didn't have time to meal prep or anything like that. And for people like me that have that kind of schedule, HelloFresh is a godsend. So if you feel like it can help you out too and just kind of make your life more convenient and also just kind of getting some good healthy food without having to spend so much time at the grocery store, I highly recommend you check out HelloFresh. If you go down to HelloFresh.com at the link in the description below and use promo code FILMROOM80, that will give you $80 off your first order plus free shipping on your first box. Again, using promo code FILMROOM80. Terms and conditions, of course, apply, but it's a great deal. I've been using them for months and months and months now, and I've I've literally never had bad food. So thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this week. And with that, let's talk about some running backs. First up, I have a guy that I mentioned earlier in this show, and that's Anthony McFarlane from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Rookie running back they just took in the fourth round. He's kind of like the Justin Jefferson of running backs for me in this class in terms of I don't think he's going to pop early, but I think he's going to pop heavily in like the back half of the season. He's sitting right now behind uh, James Conner and potentially even behind Benny Snell too. Uh, I actually haven't read much about Benny Snell in camp. I don't even know if he's healthy, but I'm pretty sure that McFarland came into camp as the RB3. But I do not think that's going to last long. I think he would at minimum jump Snell because he's just a better player than Benny Snell, in my opinion. Like, I had a monster grade uh, for him coming out of college. I have him as my RB6 out of all rookies in this entire class in terms of pre-draft grade. Like, there was only five running backs that I liked more than Anthony McFarland. He's tremendously talented. I mean, legit 4-4 speed. When he bounces and gets the edge, he is gone. Like he is, uh, he was making Ohio State look slow uh, a couple of years ago. Like he's insanely talented. And so I think that it's not going to be that long before he jumps James Conner, in my opinion. Not that I think that James Conner's a bad player, I think he's fine. But if you draft James Conner, you should definitely draft Anthony McFarland too, because he's going to take Conner's job. In my opinion, he's definitely going to take Conner's job. And this is nothing against James Conner. I think he's a fine player, but he's, he's going to get his job taken by Anthony McFarland. So if you take Conner, you have to take McFarland. Even if you don't take James Conner, you have to take Anthony McFarland, because again, he's going to be the guy that pops in the second half of the season. Um, and so I do kind of consider him among like those high priority handcuffs like Madison and Pollard and all those kind of guys. 
Um, keep in mind, Madison and Pollard, their ADP, their ADP is about like eighth or ninth round, which is about where I have them too. Do not take them unless you have the backs that are ahead of them. You know, Ezekiel Elliott, Dalvin Cook. Don't take those priority handcuffs unless you have the starters because you're not getting great value for them. With a guy like McFarlane, he is a handcuff, but he's dirt cheap. Like he's going undrafted in a lot of leagues. You can get him in probably the 12th or 13th round, no problem, as your RB5. So even if you don't have Connor, again, it's okay to take him. Whereas the other guys, you're kind of sacrificing an 8th or ninth round pick, which you can use on a tight end, you can use on a quarterback if you're waiting for quarterback. Uh, and you're not really getting value out of them unless you have the starter and you're just kind of protecting yourself. So uh, again, even though McFarlane is a handcuff, he's a different kind of handcuff because he's at a supreme value. You have to take him. Uh, you, you just do. Like he's going to be my RB5 in probably every single league because I'm that confident that he's going to take James Conner's job. And again, that's nothing against James Conner. I just love Anthony McFarlane that much. So again, w- whatever you can do, I don't, I'm not saying go out and like take him in the ninth or 10th round, but whatever you can do when you've already got four running backs and you're looking for RB5, make sure McFarlane's the guy. Now, moving on to my second running back. This is, um, I don't want to say I'm late to the party on it because I did tweet out high praise about how I was going after Antonio Gibson before all the Darius Geist stuff happened. You know, he was at like a 15th round ADP before guys got arrested and then guys got arrested. And now he's at like a 10th round ADP. I'm starting to see him like creep into like the seventh round and people are taking him as an, a true RB2. Don't do that. Like I love Antonio Gibson. I think he's going to be the guy there again, just like McFarlane in the back half of the season, maybe even early in the season. I think he's going to be the guy there. Tremendously talented running back. Um, But the value, again, you have to consider value. It's not enough just to get a guy who's going to be putting up RB2 points. You want to get an an RB2 like that, uh, an every week start at RB2 that you can put into a flex. You want to get him at a good value. Don't overpay for that. So I have him as an eighth round ADP or an eighth round pick. And right now his ADP is 10th round. Don't take him before the eighth round. I know you're going to feel tempted. I know because there's a gaping void in the depth chart and you're like he's gonna start from week one I get that he's really talented but I, I I just don't feel great about spending anything more than an eighth round pick on that I think there's a, a little bit more proven options that you can do as a true RB2 and then you can go back and get Gibson as your flex but just please don't fall into that trap I love him I absolutely love him I think he's gonna be a great weapon for Washington but this is this is kind of a unique situation where everybody's expecting it to happen. And so now the value that you were getting for him two or three weeks ago is just not there. You know, he's going seven rounds higher than he was two or three weeks ago. So again, we're, we're, we want to get good players, but we want to get good players at a value. Always prioritize value. So just hold firm. Don't take him before the eighth round. If he's there, he's there. But if he's going off the board in the sixth or seventh in your mock drafts, don't panic. Like, let other people take him there. There's plenty of other players you can get in the sixth or seventh round that are really, really good that you know are going to be really, really good. So just please don't panic. Again, I love the guy. He's going to be a great player, but you got to get him at a value. Now, running back number three, this is somebody that I feel like I've even made a mistake on, and it's kind of a different situation than Gibson. Um, because I, I feel like Dobbins is a more proven prospect as a running back. Gibson, we're really just gambling on the talent, but he really only played running back full time in like the last three games of the season last year. So again, we are, we're projecting, whereas Dobbins is a little bit more of a proven option, which it makes me a little bit more okay with taking him in the sixth or seventh round. And, and for him, I feel like I was even a little bit low on him Leading up to uh, you know making this video today, like I had Mark Ingram slated ahead of Dobbins in my rankings. Honestly, by the time I release this thing, I might have it flipped. I might have Dobbins ahead of Ingram as like a sixth or seventh round pick, with Ingram being more like seventh or eighth round, maybe even lower than that. Because again, similar to McFarland and similar to Gibson, in the back half of the year, 
when you're in the home stretch, you're in the playoffs, and you need a, a guy who's going to get 15 plus touches for you as a primary running back, Dobbins is going to be the guy for a very run heavy offense in Baltimore. Like I think any anytime like after mid October, he's getting 20 touches a game. Like that's that's what I think is going to be happening here. And again, I, he's such a proven commodity at running back. I loved him at Ohio State. I had him just ahead of Anthony McFarland in my pre-draft running back rankings. I had him as my rookie RB five. Uh, he doesn't have the juice that McFarland does in terms of vertical speed, but his vision, his contact balance. Um, his intelligence, like he's really good in pass protection in terms of like seeing blitzes and everything like that. So he's going to get third down work. He catches the ball well. He can run inside. He can run outside. Like he is a complete running back. Almost kind of reminds me of like an Arian Foster type um, in terms of like not being a physical specimen, but it's just really damn good at the position. So I love J.K. Dobbins. I think, you know, Mark Ingram is aging gracefully in that system, but I do think he's going to give way to Dobbins probably in the first five or six weeks of the season. And then after that, again, it's the Dobbins show. So I think I'm going to move him ahead of Ingram in my rankings. He's really the guy you're going to want, especially, you know, as your RB2, you know, flex kind of in that area of the draft. Um, where you're looking for a guy who's going to be getting consistent touches for you in the back half of the season. Again, he is a really, really good option for that, especially if you're missing out on all the other rookie running backs, you know, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, Jonathan Taylor, all those guys. If you miss out on those elite, elite uh, backs in this class, J.K. Dobbins, I think, is a perfect alternative that you're getting much, much cheaper, uh, and he could produce just as much like truth be told in that system he could absolutely produce the exact same level as Jonathan Taylor and the exact same level level as Clyde Edwards Alaire um just because of where he ended up so it's a perfect situation uh perfect skill set love him as like a sixth or seventh round pick uh I, I I'm probably going to end up with him as like my RB2 after going running back in the first round because I don't I, I don't think I'm ever going to go wide receiver in the first round this year unless I'm truly desperate. Um, but I'm probably going to go running back first round and then smash receiver, smash tight end, maybe pick a quarterback if there's like a really good value. And then I'm going to have J.K. Dobbins sitting there as my running back two in the sixth round. And I'm going to probably take him in like every single league. So again, uh, really, really, really good player in a perfect situation. Please do not miss the boat on him because he's going to replace Ingram sooner rather than later. Now, moving on to tight ends, every single year, uh, I kind of have one guy that I'm taking in the double digit rounds, like rounds 10 or later. Usually I don't take tight end early because I always, you know, have that late round tight end in my back pocket. This year might be a little bit different uh, because even by tight end standards, I mean, it is thin, like outside of the top five guys, it's, it's rolling the dice on a lot of these names. Um, so I might go tight end early this year, but if I don't, you know, if I have to take, you know, JK Dobbins in round six and I still don't have a tight end and I want to get to Sean in round seven and, and I'm staring down the barrel of a receiver that I really like in round eight. And I, I just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. If I do take tight end late this year, the one that I'm going after is Jonu Smith from the Tennessee Titans. He is like my one late round tight end breakout this year that I think has an excellent chance to put up, I don't want to say Darren Waller numbers, but in terms of Darren Waller type efficiency with the ball in his hands, he can absolutely do that. Again, I don't think he'll get the same target numbers that Waller got in Oakland or yeah, in Oakland last year, Vegas now. But uh, when you look at, you know, yards per route run, when you look at his yards after catch percentage, uh, like he is elite with the ball in his hands. Like in terms of his efficiency and what he does with his limited targets, it's insane. Like he's got a higher yards per route run than Hunter Henry, Austin Hooper, Evan Ingram, Zach Ertz. Like the more the more that he's on the field and the more he gets the ball in his hands, his presence is felt. He's a phenomenal athlete. Like he's a Noah Fant level athlete. Like top 1% of top 1% of tight ends ever in terms of athleticism. Just a true freak of nature. And I think you really saw that play out with his yards after catch numbers. 62% of his yardage last year was yak. Like that's George Kittle level of yak percentage who got 60 and 65% the last two years respectively. So, you know, it's insane yards after catch ability. When you get the ball in his hands in the flat and he's got 10 yards of space to work with, he's gone. 
Like he's he's a freak. And I think in that system, which is not shy about throwing to tight ends, especially off of bootlegs, you know, especially off of screens and, you know, all the kind of stuff that they they do to get the tight end involved, uh, involved. Like we saw, you know, Delaney Walker be successful in that system as well before uh, his gruesome injury and then obviously age kind of caught up to him. But there's nothing about Johnny Smith that doesn't make me think that he can get the same number of targets that Delaney was getting in this system, but then do even more with them just because of his athleticism. So again, we're, we're looking at raw upside. We're looking at freakish physical ability. And when I look for a late round tight end, which last year, my 10th round tight end that I really wanted in every single league was Mark Andrews. And then the year before that, it was George Kittle. So I have a decent track record with late round tight ends. The thing that I'm always looking for with these late round tight ends is not opportunity. It's what are they doing with the opportunity? Like I wanted Andrews because I knew he was a really good red zone threat. And even if he was going to get limited targets, which he only played like 40% of the Ravens snaps last year. So even though he's getting limited targets, I knew that they were going to be in the red zone. I knew that he was going to be highly efficient with them. And so he was like, I've smashed him in every single league because I'm like, that dude's going to get double digit touchdowns. And then he did. You know, the year before that, I knew that Kittle, again, freak of nature, 4-5 guy in a tight end friendly offense, it's going to get him in space for yards after contact or yards after catch or both really, you know, and so he was my 10th round guy that year because again, I knew it wasn't about the number of touches he gets, it's about what he does with them. And then he set the record for tight ends uh, all time for yards after catch. So I'm getting the same kind of vibes with Jonu Smith um, in terms of efficiency with what he does with limited targets. And if I do miss the boat on Kittle, if I do miss the boat on Kelsey or Andrews now that he's blown up or, you know, Jared Cook or Ertz or whoever is going ahead of him and I'm stuck with a tight end in the double digit rounds, Jonu Smith's my guy. He's going as the tight end 15 right now in most leagues and he's probably going to be somewhere in the top 10. If I had to guess, he'll be somewhere in the top 10. So he's one of the few tight ends that I think you're getting at a really good value which, as I said before, it's not that we're trying to collect talent, it's that we're trying to collect talent at a value. So please just consider Johnny Smith if you miss the boat on tight end. I'm not saying you have to pass on all these tight ends, but if you do, uh, you should really be looking at Johnny Smith. Uh, So he's my only tight end that I'm really looking at this year. So why don't we move on to quarterback to kind of wrap this whole thing up. And the first quarterback I want to talk about is, we're kind of going back to that Steelers well with Ben Roethlisberger. And the reason for that is I was thinking as I was kind of deciding what quarterbacks I wanted to highlight, like, well, I'm highlighting his receiving core. I'm highlighting his running backs. I'm highlighting, you know, the fact that his offensive line's really good. Like everything is there. And he's going as like the quarterback 15 right now. You know, why not? You know, if, if, if he has everything around him, you know, with Claypool and Juju and Deontay and Washington, I think is in spots, a good deep ball receiver. And I think his offensive line is still really good. And I think he's got a dynamic running back in, in McFarland and Connor's not bad. Why not take a chance on Big Ben who's going for dirt cheap? Like he's going as a QB two in every single league with, I think, QB one upside. You know, if you're stockpiling on running backs and you're stockpiling on receivers and you know, you're know you taking Jonu Smith in the 10th and you look up and you have no quarterback and you're planning on just kind of using um, a couple, you know, borderline QB ones, early two BQs, Q, uh, Q, QB, QB twos, QB twos. Sorry. I've been, I've, this is like my third one today. I had to, I had to do research, I guess. QB twos. Um, and you're just trying to pick the matchup week to week in terms of, um, you know, who you want to take. Like, I think Roethlisberger is a perfect option for somebody who wants to stream um, quarterbacks from week to week. Some guys just want to do set it and forget it. I totally respect that. You want to go Lamar early. You want to go Mahomes early, Wilson, Deshaun, whatever. And you want to set it and forget it. That's totally cool. For me, a, a lot of the times, I do kind of do the quarterback streaming thing because I like to think that I have a pretty good handle on defenses, from week to week and uh, you know in terms of how different passing games can exploit those defenses and just because I like to play matchups like I'm I tend to trust myself in terms of streaming quarterbacks just because I study a lot of defenses other people might not be so comfortable doing that and they might see it as more of a crapshoot totally respect that again I have success with it 
Not everybody does, so it's totally fine if you want to do an elite quarterback. But if you want to stream, Big Ben's going to be like the best streaming quarterback to me because you're again you're getting him in like the 13th round or later in most drafts, and I think he could very easily put up top 12 quarterback numbers or at minimum. You know, if you're going up against a defense that plays a lot of single high looks and they have a really small nickel, and you know they're going to put uh, Chase Claypool down in the slot, and you know you're getting that red zone matchup, and they have that connection, and he's going to throw three touchdowns. Like, if you can see those kinds of things coming in terms of looking at the defense he plays, looking at personnel mismatches, looking at schematic mismatches, and just having confidence that day, hey, Steelers' offense is going to go off. Take Ben. Like, that's what I'm going to be doing. Like, I'm not going to be playing him every week because there's going to be some times where, you know, I'm looking at a defense and they have a big physical corner like Stephon Gilmore that is totally fine with shadowing Claypool inside and taking away their best red zone weapon. And then, you know, Juju, obviously, I think he's he's good, but he's not like Antonio Brown who can beat a, a Gilmore outside either. Like, you know, if you're going against a defense where you know the matchup is not good, theoretically you're going to have another quarterback that you can stream and fill in for that week. So again, it's it's a it's a different kind of philosophy in terms of how you approach quarterback that I like to do. And for those of you that also like to do that, Big Ben is my guy. He's got the weapons. He's got the line. Um, I think he has a good relationship with Randy Fitchner. I think they're in sync in terms of play caller and quarterback. I fully expect the Steelers to be a really, really, really good team this year. Uh, and so I think Big Ben is going to be a product of that. Again, uh, don't take him early, take him late, but I think you're going to get value out of it if you take him late. In a similar kind of vein, I'm probably going to be taking Derek Carr and packaging him with Big Ben in those kind of leagues where I'm streaming quarterbacks from week to week. And I'm doing that because when I look at the surrounding supporting cast for Derek Carr, uh, my buddy Nick Arcolano made a good point. Like He is the sum of his parts, but the sum of his parts around him are pretty damn good. Great offensive line, especially in terms of pass blocking. Uh, Josh Jacobs, wonderful running back. They're going to get him more involved as a receiver. I have no questions about Jacobs being a good receiver. He's got good hands. He can run routes. He's going to be fine. Uh, the receiving court that they're putting around him. I know Tyrell Williams just got hurt, but guess what? Brian Edwards is a beast. And Ruggs, who it sounds like he's going to be their starting slot receiver over Hunter Renfro, is a beast. So even if Tyrell Williams is not 100% or just not playing at all, like they've still got good receivers. And by the way, side note, uh, for the Brian Edwards versus Henry Ruggs debate in terms of which Ra uh, you know Raiders receiver you want to draft, I'm probably going to be taking Edwards, especially because Tyrell got hurt. I think he's more of a Derek Carr type receiver in terms of just big, physical, ball skills, really good route runner. Um, you know, Derek Carr even said he reminds him of Devontae Adams, who he played with uh, back in college at Fresno State, who's another really good route runner, really physical, great ball skills, does magic <laughs> on jump balls, which, you know, him and Carr going back to college, they were like unstoppable on fades. And so I think Carr is going to really gravitate towards Edwards' skill set because you know, we saw what happened the last time he had a receiver like that, which was Devontae Adams, and they were literally unstoppable. So I'm probably going to be taking Edwards over Ruggs, especially with the Tyrell Williams injury. Not saying that Ruggs will not be productive. I'm still going to be drafting him in probably plenty of leagues because there's going to be opportunities for him. But of the two Raiders rookies, uh, Brian Edwards is my guy. Now, back to Carr. Uh, when I look at everything around him, as I mentioned, the running game is good. I think the defense is going to be vastly improved, which means he's going to get more possessions. Uh, I think the receiving core is young and unproven, but still very talented. Darren Waller, one of the most dangerous receiving tight ends in the whole league. There's a lot to work with here. And I'm also a fan of John Gruden's offense. Like I did a whole film room episode on it last year. Like it's it's not like, I mean, obviously there's, you know, 90s West Coast roots, you know, we're pounding the rock. It's a whole bunch of timing and rhythm in the past game, but there's there's some tricks up their sleeve and there's there's some modern influences that I noted in that film room episode that make me really excited about this scheme. Um, I, I think the Raiders are a really good team. I, you know, obviously the last half of the season was, was kind of rough for them, but I'm really a big fan of what they're building there. I love all the young talent they have. And Derek Carr's a good quarterback. Is he elite? No. Will he ever play like he did in 2016 again? Probably not. Like He was an MVP candidate that year. I 
don't think he's ever going to get back to that level. But he's accurate. Um, I think he's really good at keeping the offense on the field. Uh, even if he's not the most aggressive quarterback in the world, like he's he's fine. And so I think, again, what you're looking at matchups with him, you know, in terms of do they have speed that can keep up with rugs? You know, are, are there any defensive backs that run less than 4-4? If the answer is no, guess what? You're probably going to play Derek Carr because Henry Ruggs is going to tear them up. You know, if they don't have a lot of physicality at boundary corner that you know you can exploit with Brian Edwards, you know, again, that's a that's a matchup that I would love Derek Carr in. If it's a really bad defense against tight ends, uh, where they don't have any speed at linebacker or they don't have any safeties that are good against covering tight ends man to man. Again, this is a, a Derek Carr type matchup I'm looking at. He is not going to be an every week starter at quarterback, but he is going to be a quarterback that I package, as I said, with guys like Roethlisberger uh, and stream them every single week based on matchups. Same kind of thing. Not everybody's going to want to do that, but if you are getting a ton of running backs early, a ton of receivers early, and you're waiting on quarterback, Packaging Carr with Roethlisberger is one of the best possible ways you can go. Uh, I think they are they are really really underrated, and I think they have really really good supporting casts around them, and they're going to be a lot more productive than you think. Now, in terms of the opposite end of the spectrum, the opposite strategy, a quarterback that you're going to have to invest a, a little bit early in, I do think the Drew Lock hype is warranted. I just did a film room a film film room God fucking bourbon. I did a film room on him uh, very recently, and he's good. Like, he's he's good. His one flaw, or major flaw, in my opinion, was that he wasn't as aggressive as I was hoping he was going to be based on what I saw when he was at Mizzou. You know, he was throwing it all over the damn place back in college, and I kind of expected to see that aggression when he got to the NFL, and it just wasn't there. Now, was that because he got hurt early on, so he had no time to develop chemistry, and then he got thrown in in the middle of the season, and their receiving core outside of Cortland Sutton was not very good? That probably had some kind of you know effect on there, not to mention the coaching staff. Um, to say it nicely, Rich Scangarello is not Pat Shermer. Uh, I love Pat Shermer as an OC. I think he did really good things for Daniel Jones last year over in New York, and I think he's going to do excellent things for Drew Locke this year. I think Shermer kind of understands how to generate favorable matchups, and he understands, uh, especially with a receiving cord like they have with you know Cortland Sutton and then KJ Hamler, whenever he comes back from his hamstring, is just a blur down the field. Obviously, Jerry Judy, you got Noah Fant, you got Gordon who can catch the ball, Lindsey can catch the ball. Like there's there's weapons all over the place, and I think Pat Shermer is going to be a kid in a candy store because he's he's never had that much talent to work with on offense, and Drew Locke is obviously very talented himself. What I want Shermer to do is to do the same thing he did for Daniel Jones, which was create favorable matchups for Drew Locke to be aggressive down the field, and I think he will do that, which is why I'm very, very high on Drew Locke. Again, my one complaint with him was that he was really good, but he just wasn't as aggressive as I wanted him to be, I think that's going to change in 2020. So I'm I'm going all in on Drew Locke. There's a lot of leagues where I'm taking him as my QB1, as my kind of set it and forget it quarterback option, which I know is insanely risky. I totally get that that's risky, but I, I really believe in him. And it kind of depends on who's on the board, you know, with running backs and receivers. So it's not going to be every league that I do this in. But if there is that kind of, you know, second year pop that we seemingly see every single season, you know, it was Mahomes a couple years ago, uh, it was Lamar last year, if we see, um, you know, Carson Wentz even before Mahomes too in 2017. So, you know, if we see that kind of second year pop, I think it's going to be Drew Locke. And I really don't want to miss out on that. So uh, again, it's not going to be every league, but I'm, I'm riding him in a lot of leagues because I'm, I'm a big believer in the talent. I'm a big believer in the coaching staff and I'm a big believer in the roster that they built around him. So uh, to wrap this up, those are kind of the 10 main sleepers that I'm really focusing on. Some of them maybe aren't true sleepers, but uh, the 10 main value plays that I'm focusing on for my PPR and my standard leagues this year at receiver, at running back, at tight end and at quarterback. Um, I, I think there's many more that I could talk about. I could go more in depth on Brian Edwards because I love Brian Edwards. You know, I could talk about Chase Edmonds and all those kind of guys, but, uh, there's only so much I could talk about in one day. So thank you all for joining me. 
I hope you were kind of taking notes on the ranks that I had on screen uh, throughout this whole special. If you want them in a, in a Excel document format, again, just go to my Patreon link down below. Any donation of a dollar or more gets you access to every single PDF, every single Excel doc, every single update to those PDFs and Excel docs, because I'm going to be making updates from now until opening day. Or alternatively, if you guys don't want to sign up for Patreon, if you don't want to deal with all that, but you still want to get access to the rankings, uh, go down to this link, uh, pick up any film room merch, uh, whether it's a hat, beanie, shirt, whatever, and then send uh, an email to this email that's also on the screen with your order number. I'll send you the rankings and then you know have an unlimited you know private Q&A with me about whatever you want to talk about. It can be any football topic, any fantasy topic, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, kind of my way of saying thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for, for being here with me uh, along on this ride that I never thought was going to work. And um, I'm very grateful for it. So again, thank you everyone for watching this whole damn thing. Uh, my ice melted. That's how long I've been recording. Uh, so I'm going to go finish this watered down old fashioned and then get to work on my next film room episode, which is going to be coming out sometime after the first uh, Sunday slate of games. So keep an eye out for that. I'll see you guys soon. And until then, later.